A while back, I decided to design my own VCO and make a video series about it, detailing the process. And while most of the functionality I've implemented is working fine, it's been bothering me that there is no option for controlling the pulse wave's width with a voltage. It could only be done manually in the original design. So in this video, we'll change that and fix a rather annoying bug while we're at it. If you're curious how that might sound in the end, here's a quick demo. First things first, let's talk about that bug. What's the problem? Well, if you've built along with my videos and checked the square wave output on your oscilloscope, chances are you encountered some unexpected behavior. As long as the pulse width is set to 50%, everything looks fine. The wave is properly centered around zero volts. But watch what happens as I increase the width. The wave is moving downwards by a considerable margin. At its most extreme, the new center is now at around minus 4.5 volts, which is an unacceptably big DC offset in our signal that can manifest in noticeable distortion. If you listen closely, you should be able to hear it. Okay, so how does this happen? Did I forget to add AC coupling to the square wave output? No, it's actually right here. A 1 microfarad capacitor paired with a 100k resistor to ground. Then how come it's not doing its job? Shouldn't this eliminate any DC offset from our signal? Well, as it turns out, AC coupling is not a one-size-fits-all solution. If we go back to our water analogy, this actually becomes quite obvious. Let's consider three example input signals. First, a 50% square wave with no offset then a 50% square with a positive offset, and finally a 5% square with a positive offset. In the first case, the signal will pass through here virtually unaffected. This is because we chose a large capacitor and a strong resistor here, meaning that the metaphorical balloon can displace a lot of water, while the narrow pipe here only lets a tiny amount flow down to and up from ground. Here's what happens in detail. First, the voltage on this side will rise to 5 volts almost instantly. Since our capacitor behaves like an elastic membrane between these two areas, that voltage can push right through it, raising the voltage here to 5 volts as well. Now, while the wave stays in its high phase, water will very slowly but continuously drain out through this resistor, leaving this area. Which means that the voltage here will drop ever so slightly. Now, like I said, because the capacitor and resistor are both quite big, that drop in voltage will be negligible. But it is there. And so right before input wave swings low, the voltage on this side will be a bit below 5 volts. Which, strangely, means that once that wave does swing low, the voltage here will drop to a level slightly below minus 5 volts. Why is that? Simple because of the water we've squeezed out of this area. So when the pressure on this side drops, there will be less water overall filling the now freed up space, which results in a pressure level that is lower than the pressure over here. Now, of course, that situation won't last. Because the voltage here is now negative in relation to ground, a current will start flowing up through our resistor, raising the voltage here very slowly. And once the input wave swings high again, the voltage here will jump to a level slightly above 5 volts. And the whole process repeats. As we can see, the output waveform is barely affected, and it stays centered around 0 volts. Ok, so on to the next example. If we add an arbitrary offset voltage to our 50% square wave, the capacitor-resistor combo will eliminate that offset no problem. Here's how that works. Since both the high and low phases are now in the positives, the voltage over here will be dropping very slightly during both. 
And so bit by bit, wave cycle after wave cycle, the oscillation center will be shifted downwards slowly. But once we reach the zero volts line, things get interesting. Because now, no water will drain out of this area during the wave's low phase, because the pressure over here is no longer above the neutral level. But this doesn't mean that the waveform stops its downward motion there. During the high phase, the voltage here will still drop, netting us a further slowed down, but still measurable descending drift. Only when the waveform center reaches the zero volts line, the situation will stabilize. This is because now the voltage drop during the high and the voltage rise during the low phase exactly cancel each other out, since both phases have exactly the same duration. And now you might have a clue as to why this does not work with a square wave that's not perfectly symmetrical. To understand this in detail, let's look at our final example, a 5% pulse wave with a positive offset. Now in the beginning, this wave will drift down just like the one before. But once it crosses the zero volts line, we start running into trouble. Since the high phase is so much shorter in duration than the low phase, the voltage drop during the former will be really small, while the voltage rise during the latter will be disproportionately big. This means that once the low phase dips into the negatives just slightly, the wave will stop its downward drift ultimately stabilizing with a big offset like the one we saw on the oscilloscope earlier. So essentially, we're dealing with a balancing issue here. For AC coupling to work properly, our wave needs to be symmetrical. Which, by the way, is why it does work with sawtooth, sine and triangle waves. So what's the alternative? Easy, not having to remove an offset in the first place. In my original VCO design, I chose a rather convoluted way of converting our sawtooth core signal into a square, which involved first using an op amp to blow the signal up and then feeding it into a Schmidt trigger inverter. That inverter then spit out a pulse wave with a fixed offset of plus six volts. Now, luckily, there's a much simpler way of doing it with just one op amp. No Schmidt trigger needed, no offset added. For this, we'll have to set up that op amp in what's known as the comparator configuration. At its most basic, this is what that looks like. It's just a plain op amp without feedback. We send our signal to the non-inverting input, while setting the comparator's threshold by applying a voltage to the inverting input. Okay, but what does a comparator do exactly? The name might have given it away already. A comparator compares a signal to a given threshold voltage. If the signal is above the threshold, the comparator's output will swing to the positive supply voltage. And if the signal is below that threshold, it will swing to the negative supply voltage. Here's how that works in detail. So we know that an op amp will continuously look at the voltages present at its two inputs. It then subtracts the detected value here from the detected value here, multiplies the result by its huge gain, and then pushes out that result here or the closest doable value, which is virtually always going to be either plus or minus 12 volts in our case. To look at this through a more practical lens, we can visualize it like this. I've overlaid our sawtooth wave, a few different example threshold voltages, and the comparator's output in these graphs. As you can see, the pattern is really simple. Whenever the sawtooth is above the threshold, the comparator's output is high and whenever it's below that threshold, the output is low. This means that the comparator does not only convert the input signal into a square, it also allows us to freely control that square's width by applying a specific threshold voltage, which is super handy because we can kill two birds with one stone. To try this out, I've already put together our sawtooth core here on the breadboard. Next, I'll set up a 100k potentiometer as a variable voltage divider so that we have a control voltage source. And now all that's left to do is send our sawtooth wave into this op amp's non-inverting input while connecting our CV source to the inverting input. Set up our oscilloscope and we're ready to go. Okay, so right now I have the potentiometer pretty much perfectly centered. So our output is close to being a 50% square wave. Now, if I start turning the knob, you'll notice that the usable range is really small. Most of the potentiometer sweep is pretty much dead. 
Why is that? Well, if we take a look at the signal our sawtooth core is putting out, you'll notice that it's not very loud. It's swinging just between around plus and minus 1.5 volts. And if our sawtooth is that tiny, then the area within which it's able to cross the threshold voltage is also really small. So as soon as that threshold is above plus or below minus 1.5 volts, the comparator's output will simply stay low or high, effectively killing the oscillation. What can we do about that? You might have guessed it. We need to make sure our threshold stays within that exact window. And the easiest way to do this is by using a plain voltage divider. A 100K, 14K combination scales plus minus 12 volts down to around plus minus 1.5. So I'll simply remove this jumper, plug in a 100K resistor in its place, and then add a 14K resistor to ground right here. Cool, so now the usable range is actually usable. Next, let's add an external CV input. Doing that is as simple as mixing it in using another resistor. Choosing a value for that resistor is where it gets tricky though. Because with a multi-input voltage divider like this, a signal's presence in the mix is directly determined by that resistor's value. And so we will have to answer two questions here. First, what range of voltages are we expecting to receive from the external source? And then, do we want our PWM to go through zero? Meaning, should the CV be able to silence the oscillation? In my case, my LFOs are pushing out voltages ranging from plus to minus seven volts, and I would like my PWM to be able to go through zero. Now, while you could exactly calculate the needed resistor values for those parameters, I chose to go with trial and error as usual. And the value that worked best for me was a 68K resistor for the external CV. Also, I decided to add a 250K potentiometer in series here, so you can adjust the CV intensity on the fly. To try this out, I'll connect an audio circuit and set up another potentiometer, routing the input signal through that potentiometer to the op-amps inverting input through a 68K resistor. Plug in my LFO, and we should be able to test this. And yeah, as you can see, the LFO is modulating the pulse width. If I turn the CV intensity up, we can see that it is indeed going through zero. Perfect. Now there's just one thing left to do. Get our signal down to 10 volts peak to peak. Because at the moment, we're at around 24 volts peak to peak, which is way too loud. In my original design, I decided to reduce the square wave's volume with a plain voltage divider. And while that does work, it is not an ideal solution. This is because a module's output impedance can be important in some scenarios. And with the voltage divider I used, that output impedance set at a whopping 20 kilo ohms, which meant the VCO signal was rather weak and susceptible to loading effects. That's why in most professional designs, a module's output has an impedance of just 1K. So why not use a voltage divider with lower resistor values then? Simple because that would waste a lot of current by dumping it straight into ground. In our case, almost 10 milliamps, which is way inefficient. So what's the solution? You guessed it. Use a high value voltage divider and buffer it using an op amp. This way, we're not wasting a lot of current while still providing a strong output signal. Stick a 1K resistor between our op amps and modules output and everything's up to standard. And while we're at it, I've also quickly aligned our sawtooth output on the schematic by exchanging the 20k here with a 1k. So finally, we can put all of this together. I'll route our square wave to another op-amp buffer through a 100k resistor. Add in a 68k to ground and a 1k between the op-amp's output and another jack socket and we're done. Let's listen in. Using a slow LFO, we can mimic a kind of detuned multi-oscillator sound. Also, we can add a rhythmic element by having the PWM go through zero. <laughs> <laughs> 
And what's really cool in my opinion is modulating the pulse width with an audio rate oscillator. This can give you some really strange harsh sounds. All in all, I think this is a really worthwhile update for my VCO. And as a nice side effect, it even frees up a Schmidt trigger inverter. So theoretically, you could now build a sextuple VCO module with just one 4106 chip. Though that might admittedly be somewhat of an overkill. And that's all I have for this video. If you've enjoyed it, consider supporting me on Patreon, so I can keep bringing you content like this. Anyways, thanks for watching and until next time, see ya.